The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. And uh, joining us on the phone is the author of Savage Appetites, Four True Stories of Woman, Crime, and Obsession, Rachel Monroe. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So, uh, uh, first of all, Rachel, um, what led you to write this book? Well, to be honest, it started with curiosity about my my own strange mind, I suppose. Uh, I, I tend to think of myself as a, as a nice, kind, friendly, nonviolent person, and yet... Um, there were these periods in my life when all the all I wanted to consume were stories of just like the worst things that humans did, and uh, that really kind of puzzled me. I wasn't sure what I got out of it, and and why those stories uh, were so appealing to me. It felt um, like that there was something wrong with that. But then I also understood that I was uh, by far not the only one, and so um, it started with that curiosity about myself, and then it and then once I started realizing how. Uh, the majority of the audience for these crime stories was women. Um, that really struck me as something that was uh, interesting and surprising, and was something I wanted to, to dig further into. So, hmm. so what were the differences? Like, did you find that uh, men just didn't do have the same fascination, or did you ever research the differences and the percentages? Well, you know, there are, it's hard to get uh, clear or strict percentages, um, but it's definitely the case that if you look at the audiences for a lot of the true crime podcasts out there, they'll, they're typically, or a lot of them, the ones that I found were maybe two-thirds, at least two-thirds of the listen, listenership is women. Um, there have been studies about uh, true crime books and how that audience is disproportionately female. Um, there are these uh, true crime uh, TV um, cable networks now that just have only true crime programming, and they have a, a majority female audience as well, like over 80% female. Um, even shows like CSI, which are obviously not true, um, but are, are in the same kind of space, um, they definitely draw a, an, a more female audience. How curious, Rachel, because when I do my lectures... I I have noticed that the majority in the the audience is female. I w I wonder if this is the same thing. Yeah, and I think I mean, and which is not to say there aren't men who are interested in these topics. Of course, there are. These are these are things that, in some ways, just preoccupy us as as human beings. And and that and one of my answers to when people ask why do women love true crime is like, well, women are people, and and people love true crime. Um, but it is interesting and notable that it does seem to be uh, disproportionately a female interest. I, I just I just wonder, um, what about the true crime or the murder um, fascinates females so much more than men? Um, is it just they're, they're, they get more personal with, with the, the killer and the victims? I think some ways it can be. Um, I think that can be a, a big motivation. The trend uh, that you're seeing in true crime more recently, maybe since the 90s, is to be just like you're saying, very psychological about the about the perpetrator, about maybe his childhood, his family, his motivations, or uh, about the victim. Um, and I think I do think that that um, interest in, in human psychology and particularly the dark side of human psychology um, tends to appeal to women. Um, I think uh, also sometimes you'll hear from women that uh, their interest stems from um, an experience that they had, a traumatic experience that they had, either personally or maybe somebody that they knew was a was a victim of a crime, and um, that really spurred their interest um, because I do think that there are some people, uh, maybe a lot of people, um, when there's something that's, that's frightening to them, they want to get closer to it, you know, and learn more about it, and that, that helps them feel safe or in control. So that, that might be part of it, too. Rachel, you, uh, 
you linked it to uh, what you talked about four ar- archetypes. Is that connected to that? Well, yeah, definitely. I, I the way I structured the book because just like we're talking about now, it's I ended up realizing that there are so many different reasons and some reasons for uh, an interest in these stories might apply to the one woman that wouldn't apply at all to another woman. And so um, just to capture some of the breadth there, um, I looked at four different archetypes of um, identification, kind of like, you know, when you read a crime story, are you are you identifying with the detective? You know, are you, are you thinking about how am I going to solve this crime? Are you identifying with the victim, uh, which a lot of people do? Um, are you identifying maybe with the lawyer who's, who's trying to bring justice? Um, or in some cases, are you identifying uh, with the killer, hmm. which is, is more troubling, but is, is certainly something that Like, that like a col- Columbine kind of situation? Yeah, one of the stories that I, I write about in the book is about a young woman in Illinois who um, became, during a period in her life when, when she was pretty depressed and isolated, living in her parents' house, unemployed, very few friends, um, she became really fascinated with Columbine. And um, and there are, are a lot of people online and a lot of young women online who uh, really identify with um, the Columbine killers and, and see mm. them as uh, I don't know if heroes is the right word but but um, see in them something that they find appealing which is really oh. troubling for sure yes so so was there a particular um, reason that you chose these four stories like you've probably come across a lot of different stories uh, in your research, but was there something in each one of these that that grabbed your attention? Well, each of these women uh, is a pretty extreme case, right? So if we're talking about uh, interest in crime, crime stories, uh, true crime, that's something that I have, but it certainly hasn't taken over my whole life at all. Um, but I think that it can be really useful to uh, to look at some of the more extreme cases, the outliers. I think they can uh, they can help reveal a pattern, maybe in some ways. Mm-hmm. And, and by looking at the people who are the most extreme, we can kind of see where we fall on that spectrum. Like, okay, well, maybe I'm not going to devote my whole life to um, getting somebody out of prison who was wrongfully convicted, but um, but there's a little part of that fight for justice that that I do identify with, um, and so and so these four women they really I mean their whole lives in some ways uh, became became dedicated to um, these various crime stories. Well, your first one uh, was it Francis Glessner Lee, the nutshell studies that you speak about. Yeah, exactly. The uh, I uh, in 2016 I I did a lecture in Baltimore. And a fellow lecturer was Bruce Goldfarb, who is the uh, keeper of those oh, models. Great. So I was curious. Yeah, he's writing a book about. He's. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just saying that he's writing a book about Francis Glessner Lee, which which I think will be really great because he he knows more than anybody. Oh, he he was mesmerizing. So that was really an uh, interesting conversation about. I think it was 18 models there, is what I remember. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely, and. And they're so, uh, they were displayed at the Smithsonian recently, which, um, to be honest, like gave me a little twinge of, of envy because it used to be they, they had really never been on public display before, uh, and I felt very proprietary towards, <laughs> towards them. They are these, uh, just to try to explain them, they're very strange. Um, they're these, they look like dollhouses. You could call them dollhouses, but the, the woman who made them, Frances Glessner Lee, did not like people referring to them as dollhouses because to her, that made them sound like they were playthings or uh, toys in some way, and and they were not. They were um, educational tools, and but they did look like dollhouses, and they're very precise. They have they're very particularly done. Like the little, there's a little tiny mouse trap in one of them, and it really snaps. <laughs> um, you can read the headlines on the tiny little newspapers. Uh, but the thing that makes them special is that in each each one of these dollhouse rooms, um, there's a dead body, a dead doll, um, hmm. and her intention was that they would be 
used uh, to train police officers to investigate crime scenes in a very deliberate, scientific way, um, rather than uh, she thought there was a problem of, of bias and kind of instinctual investigations that wasn't rooted in objective science. And so uh, there are all these little clues in these, in these models um, that if you, if you look at them carefully, you can figure out whether this, the dead doll was killed by uh, suicide, was it, whether it was an accident, whether it was murder, um, that you have to very be very logical and very observant, and that's what she was trying to train police officers to do. Yeah. Well, she that's she must she was must like the beginning basic science. That's a, that's impressive to have yeah. to do that at such a time. She's a fascinating woman. She she grew up in the she was born in the 19th century um, into a family that um, really didn't believe in that women should get education particularly um and and she wanted to be a nurse but her family forbade that and then when she was in in middle age and she came into her inheritance she essentially trained herself in in forensics which as you're saying was was really new then and and had to kind of self-educate um because she she hadn't been given the opportunity to go about uh learning these things in a traditional way and and she became a real expert and um, but it was always a struggle for her because people didn't take her seriously. They thought she was, it was quirky, you know, that you had this this woman who's a grandmother uh, talking about blood splatter and things like that. Um, but she really was like a, a real expert, real hmm. self-trained expert on this science. And I think Bruce was talking about maybe that that what's that show called Murder She Wrote that uh, the uh, yeah. That there's a connection there, so that they may have used her or something. Yeah, and there's also a there was a character on a season of CSI who was based on her. I think that it it was a, a killer called the Miniature Killer, who would hmm. build uh, tiny replicas of of the crime scenes and leave them behind as clues, and, and that's also <laughs> based based on Francis Glessner Lee. Wow. Uh, that that to me, I was always intrigued by that when I had read that that. Uh, so you got you got to see those at the Smithsonian? No, you know I saw. Well, I did see them at the Smithsonian, but I first saw them a decade ago um, at the Maryland Medical Examiner's Office. Oh, okay. Um, I've been fascinated with them for a long time, and I just I found an excuse to finagled my way in there into the Medical Examiner's Office to to get a look at them. I just remember the detail. That her obsession must have been just intense, just to be patient enough to do all of that. She was, I think, a really difficult person to be around in that she had such an incredible mind and she was so driven. And, and just like you're saying, you know, you look at these tiny dollhouse rooms and the precision is so obsessive and intense. You, you kind of get a sense of her personality. But there's also some fun. Oops, we lost them. Making them these, these oh. perfect little puzzles. Um, but she got in a lot of fights with a lot of people, kind of like I was saying before, because she wasn't taken. All she wanted was to be taken seriously, and she was trying to work with these scientists at Harvard, and, and they really didn't weren't that interested in hearing what she had to say. Well, I, I think they still use those ideas or those models even today. So that she she quite quite the influential uh, person. Yeah, it's really incredible. And one of the cool things about the nutshell studies is, um, like I said, they are all a little tiny murder mysteries. Um, and, and in most cases, the, the answers, the solution the, to the whodunit is not public knowledge. And so even when they were on display at the, uh, at the Smithsonian, the answer wasn't right there. So it was really fun to just eavesdrop on people trying to puzzle it out. And with so many of these crime stories, we're used to having closure, right? To like knowing it, it all wraps up in a neat little bow at the end, um, and and you don't get those with her models, which I think is pretty cool. And that's because they do still want to use them as as training tools. And if if the answers were out there on the internet, um, th that wouldn't work anymore. Oh, true, true. <laughs> There's always an answer on the internet. Come on. <laughs> I did. I heard from uh, one of the other. One of the other folks who works at the Maryland Medical Examiner's uh, office, a funny story where um, so they, they use these these little dollhouses uh, to train police officers still every year in, in these investigative uh, techniques. And um, the answers are all in a locked 
file cabinet in uh, the administrator's office. And and one day he came back to work late one night and found that the police officers in the training were trying to break into his file cabinet <laughs> to steal the answers to like steal a peek because they were so they felt so frustrated that they couldn't they couldn't solve the crime they just couldn't stand it so they were they were they were trying to cheat but <laughs> well uh, that explains why Bruce Padlock. And that explains why Bruce Goldfarb, when he was doing his lecture, he was very cryptic about those answers. So now I get it. Mm -hmm. well. <laughs> yep. Yeah, if you want them to still be useful, you've got to keep the mystery alive. <laughs> Is that sort of a big... Um how do, you, how do you say it? Is that what draws people in, is that, that the unsolved part of it, that everyone tries to be that armchair detective? I think for some people that's a real a real motivation. I think that um, in writing that chapter on, on the detective, that seemed to me to be the appeal of that archetype is, um, you know, the detective is the one who figures everything out. Um, they're, they're, they get to kind of remain slightly separate from the crime, they have the um, this allure of omniscience, right, and, and mm -hmm. seeing the one who knows and who solves things, and I think that can be really attractive. And, and you see that a lot in um, the contemporary equivalent, I guess, is these uh, online amateur detectives, and that's a very, uh, there are a lot of them on the Internet, and a lot of them are women. And you're talking to one right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of these people. <laughs> you're, you're one of the women online. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. But but I'm telling you, I'm obsessed with uh, doing the detective and searching like that. <laughs> yeah, cold cases and stuff like that. Oh, I'm uh, I focus on the uh, the the Whitechapel murders, Jack the Ripper, and uh, specific suspects. Oh. And that's what my books are. Oh on. man. So. <laughs> so who did it? <laughs> oh, of course I know that. No, no. In research, uh, <laughs> how I do it because uh, is that. If you ever say 100% case closed, then you are done, and you're not a true researcher. You you just want to fill a belief, and I I, I hate that. I'm a I'm a, my background is science, and so it's all about the data. So uh, totally. so, but if I was a betting man, I would say uh, the guy that I researched, Francis Tumbley, he's a pretty character, but uh, but he. Uh, so that uh, I think that's what intrigued me, and even though that you were, uh, you know, definitely focused on these women, I I just remember doing that as well. So, and then you also did. Yeah, well, uh, I think. What's that? Oh, I was just going to say, I think you're totally right that there is there is uh, among some people a real a real desire to have a a definitive answer, um, and and that's uh, that's so troubling because in a lot of these cases we won't ever know, we can't ever know. For sure. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not like movies then, TV then. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> and then also, okay. I was just, I was curious about. Uh, I was reading a little bit that you were talking about uh, the guest house of Sharon Tate as well. And yes. So um, 50 years ago this month uh, is when, when Sharon Tate and a number of other people were murdered by the Manson family. Um, and and I, I tend to be interested in, in more of the, the aftermath of a crime than the, the actual crime itself, and that's certainly a story that um, looms large in the cultural imagination. And, and that house, too, the house where the Manson family killed Sharon Tate and, and those other people, um, became um, kind of a, a dark tourist attraction in its own way, and um, I write about I write about that house and and some of the people who passed through that house, including a young woman who um, who rented it uh, in the 1990s um, and and moved into the place where Sharon Tate was murdered, um, and then became really fascinated with that case, um, and mm. and it, in some ways maybe it took over her life too. Hmm. <coughs> Do you, do you think that, um, in a way, um, people watch or get into true crime because it kind of there's something they relate to and they're kind of facing their own fears, maybe? I think in a lot of cases that's certainly uh, true. And, and um, in, the vic in the section that I write about the, the victim, um, when people talk about uh, empathy and identification, I think 
that's, that can be a big motivation is um, maybe something has happened in their own life and, and maybe it wasn't as, as terrible as being murdered probably, but um, some other kind of trauma or violence and um, and then reading about things that happen to other people helps them work through what happened to them. Hmm. <clears throat> what, what, Were you... Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, what do you hope people get out of your book? Like when they when they pick up the book and they read it, what is it you're trying to get across to them? You know, honestly, I think it's a lot of about what we were just talking about and the, um, the lack of closure and the um, resistance to maybe easy answers or, or formulaic answers. Um, I think that the more that you learn, uh, in some ways, the more you realize how, how much you don't know. And, um, and I hope that this book maybe calls people to question when they feel like they, they have a, a sense of certainty about, you know, this definitely happened. Um, I guess I just want people to, to, to question that a little bit more. And then also to think um, in more complicated and nuanced ways about, you know, what does it mean when we're taking um, real violence that happened to real people and, and turning it into entertainment. Um, I'm not saying that that's bad, but I think it's something that we uh, just need to think about in a, in a complex and thorough way. Are you, are you thinking that that might lead to some sort of trouble as well? If people like enjoy that, like getting into entertaining and having conventions and meetings and talking about your favorite murder, you know? Right, exactly. No, I think that it, it can be the danger is that the fact that these are real people and real terrible things that happen to real people can get can get lost. I mean, there's so many things on the Internet happen like that, right? It's, it's easy to forget that there's a real person on the other side of the screen. And um, there's been some great writing by there's a piece in the Washington Post recently about a man whose sister was murdered and um, how strange it is for him um, to... Uh, read about his sister online and all these people kind of speculating about her personal life and, and treating, um, <clears throat> treating her murder as if it was a, an interesting puzzle um, or an intellectual exercise um, and, and not maybe fully realizing that, that there was a real person with, with family members out there. Um, but then at the same time, he's also really grateful that, that people are paying attention to her story at all. So I think it cuts both ways. Um, mm. But, yeah, I think murder as strict entertainment, um, that gets you into some shaky ethical territories, for sure. <laughs> the, it's interesting, it's like these copycats, uh, you could see them getting obsessed with this particular, you know, offender or something, and then the next thing you know, we have a copycat killer, kind of like the Columbine situation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you see that over and over. There have been, I think, over... 30, maybe even more at this point, um, mass shooters who have identified Columbine as their model, as their heroes, as their inspiration. And so I think that that was something I thought about a lot in writing that chapter on, on people who identify with killers is what responsibility do we have as a, when, as a culture? How do we make sure that we're not, we're getting information out there, but we're not um, accidentally glamorizing or glorifying um, people who do these terrible acts. Well, it's interesting um, about... Creating, helping contribute to that mythology. Well, it's interesting about your archetypes. The, uh, there's this emotional connection, yet with the detective, how I always look at it is trying to uh, dis uh, disengage from any kind of emotion to, so to try to, to avoid bias whatsoever, to try to do that. I could see where there's a conflict just like that brother of the woman that the the, mm. the, the, the sister that was killed, you could see that mm -hmm. happening. Totally. But I also think that it's it's dangerous for us to think that we can be completely bias free. Yes. Um, you know, we're all we're always trapped inside our own head and so it's so important to have the humility to, to remember that but that's a good goal to strive for. But um, yes. it's always gonna be that. It's like it's a goal maybe more than a reality. Right. Did you ever come across any stories that kind of really scared you? As in from the person telling it? You know, yeah. 
it's funny. I, I had always prided myself. I don't know how you guys are, but I had always prided myself on, on being able to kind of remain remain separate, remain objective, and, and to realize, you know, statistically speaking, um, murder, especially I'm, you know, like a white woman, that, that I'm not really statistically at risk to be murdered, um, particularly by a stranger. Like, that, you know, I, I should just worry about being struck by lightning if that's what I'm <laughs> scared of. Um, but at the same time, writing that story about the, the young woman, Lindsay Savannah Rath, who was fascinated by Columbine and planned a mass shooting, um, to do that, I had to read um, oh, like thousands of pages of of her writings and her chat transcripts, her conversations um, with the boy that she she planned this massacre with. And mm-hmm. there was something about that that really did get in my head. I had kind of thought that I was immune, um, but I there was just something about all that hate um, directed at just random strangers and the way they they, they fantasized about this thing that they wanted to do, um, that really I could feel myself being out in public and, and feeling paranoid, and usually I love talking to strangers, and but I felt myself getting kind of closed off and, and nervous and, and shutting down, because um, you, feel- you don't really know what's in anybody's head. So as so your thought not was that you are starting to identify with this person and then you started looking at people the same way. It was the other way around that you could right. be someone else's victim. I could be somebody else's victim. You're right. But it also did make me in some ways, my actions, even if I was afraid of uh, somebody committing violence against me, the the outcome was that I was behaving like her. I was be- becoming more isolated, becoming mm-hmm. more kind of closed in with myself, becoming more paranoid. And, and I think that um, those ideologies of violence they do that they they isolate people make them feel really alone and scared and and disconnected and um mm. that was the one that really like got in my head for a while <laughs> so what are your what, who who do you draw from what's your what's your big influences that's a great question um, um there are a lot of writers who uh write about crime in really interesting ways that i find fascinating um Janet Malcolm is a writer who wrote a book uh, called The Journalist and the Murderer, which I really love. Um, there's a journalist down here in Texas named Pamela Koloff who writes a lot about wrongful convictions and forensic science and the justice system. Um, she's a real inspiration to me. Um, there's, young, there's a woman in Tennessee who wrote a book called Dead Girls last year, and uh, it's all about how... Um, about pop culture mystery stories um, and how often they have at their heart or at their center, you know, a, a, a dead girl. Um, so those are all writers who I think are approaching the subject in, in different and interesting ways that I find really inspiring. Now, do you, do you have a website or a place that people can go if they want to find out more about you? Yeah, definitely. My website is uh, Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, dash, Monroe, M-O-N-R-O-E, dot com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. I'm probably on Twitter too much. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, it's always, always I'm plenty there. Yeah, it's a, it's a bad, <laughs> it's a bad thing. Uh, well, fantastic. Now, I guess your book is sold everywhere and it's online. We will have it on our webpage as well, so people listening can just go one click and pick up the book. Um, again, our guest today has been Rachel Monroe, and the book is Savage Appetites: Four True Stories of Woman Crime and Obsession. Thank you for being here, Rachel. It was such a pleasure to talk to you guys. Thank you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This is here production of something with media. I'll be back.